Um, so I have some handouts. Um, one of the handouts is just a very small bibliography of some of the, the relevant literature, and I'm going to summarize some of the arguments or findings from that. Um, another one is, you're probably all familiar with the Kohlberg scale of moral development. In fact, Kohlberg himself uh, wrote some things on the prisons. He did some of his research in prisons. Um, so the other, the other things are um, some exercises that we'll do along the way. This question, why, why teach philosophy in prison in the first place? And there's, there's a variety of answers. Um, for me, it started out actually I, I needed a job. And that was the, uh, the available job. So I took it on. The, the first thing that I heard from somebody who had done a lot of orientation sessions at Indiana State Prison was that there's two good things in prison, education and religion, everything else is bad. So you're bringing something to these men that, that they, can, they can appreciate, and that was, that was true. Um, another important motive is involving oneself in positive transformation of the inmates. And you can think of this in social terms, in terms of recidivism. Um, how, many, how many of these people are returning to prison? And there are, there are a lot of studies that show that uh, educational achievements in prison correlate with lower recidivism, whether it's even just getting a GED. Uh, once you start getting to college education, recidivism goes down dramatically. And it's not, it's not simply due, I think, to greater employability. I think that a lot of it has to do with, with uh, the capacities for moral transformation. Rehabilitation is part of that. I can say that I've actually seen re rehabilitation taking place in individuals and in uh, groups of individuals who associated with each other voluntarily within the prison. Um, I, I was privileged in that because of the, the program that I was in, I could, I could observe inmates class after class after class throughout their entire college career. Uh, so that, that was very helpful for that. Uh, it could be part of your personal or professional growth. Um, working in a prison uh, gives you another environment to try things out in to see whether you know, philosophy really is applicable or not. Um, it, it's very different than the on-campus setting that you know, we're used to. And uh, for many people, it can be a form of service to the community or to those who are incarcerated or you know, the wider network of people that are affected by, by incarceration. Uh, so that, those are all motives for doing, for doing it. But what about opportunities? It varies from state to state. Um, prison education has been on the attack for about the last 15 years. A lot of states have canceled their, their programs that, that dealt with it explicitly. Um, there are only about 11 states that still have uh, full-born prison education programs that are funded by the state. Indiana is one of them, so North Carolina is one. I don't know if South Carolina has them. Some of them are degree programs, some of them are just course programs, where they, they take a smattering of courses, but then they can, they can use that when they get out to transfer into a, a college. There's also initiatives um, by institutions, and I wanted to point out the Bard Prison Initiative, which, which is connected with these, these other uh, state types as well, but where an institution actually decided it wanted to take uh, an active role, a more active role than, than some of the universities that participate in, in prison education. There's also the possibility of affiliating with volunteer programs or groups. Uh, if your state doesn't have prison education, they may very well have character-based or faith-based uh, uh, prison um, that perform um, sort of self-modification programs. And they're, they're always looking for volunteers to teach in those. Ethics is a component in those quite often. Then there's independent initiatives, and uh, some people are fairly entrepreneurial with this. They just contact a prison. I, I have a friend up at St. Anselm's College who um, brings in play discusses platonic dialogues with uh, prisoners at the women's prison. And he doesn't have any backing from St. Anselm itself or from, from the DOC. It's just something that goes on. But there's a lot of room for those, those sorts of things. Uh, in, in part because um, what I've found, at least with the Indiana DOC and the North Carolina DOC, is that the guards, the uh, administration, they recognize the value of education. Sometimes it's purely instrumental. If they're in the classroom, they're not, they're not 
out in their, their cell blocks making trouble. Um, it also <coughs> gives them something, if they're in a, a full-blown program, it gives them something that can be taken away from them. So it's good for uh, uh, discipline that way. But there are many um, correctional officers and administrators who, who really support prison education. Uh, it's a question often of finding resources. One of the things that I'd like to do with the first handout that, that I've given you is to just take a moment and do a little bit of reflection. Um, and think about what are, what are your two most important goals in teaching ethics courses. I assume all of you get to teach ethics courses from time to time. Um, and so put, it, put aside any of the uh, accreditation business that we all have to go through every five to ten years. And just think about what is it that you really want students to, to get from your ethics courses. And then after that, um, if you were to teach in prison, what would you want, what content would you want them to take away from your ethics course? What are some of your, your answers to the first one? Yeah. I, um, for my ethics students, it would be a, uh, to facilitate empathy in them and also to an appreciation of the complexity of ethical decision making. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, moral reasoning skills would be one, and also respect for diversity of perspective, which would be some of the empathy. Yeah. Will they be mutually supportive? Um, <clears throat> I want them to be more ethical, uh, but specifically through understanding their own uh, competences, psychological competences, emotional, rational, um, volitional, that um, go into um, ethical competence. Yeah, reflection is important. What did some of you put for the second part? Let's say you were to teach in prison. What are you meaning by ethics content? What is it that from the course that they're carrying away? I would say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I would change based on who the students were. I'd have to be the students too. Yeah. I, I wrote the same things except more for the 18 year olds in my college than the 22 year olds. I want them to think they can do it. You know, when they read Mill or Khan or Plato, uh, they're always like, oh my gosh, it's the dead white men, you know, come, I can't possibly, you know. And like, well, no, let's look at some of Mill's examples or some of, you know, you're not, you're not going to get your music in Plato's Republic because that'll corrupt you. And oh, well, yeah, that's not right. And so they can actually get in there and, and do it. And I don't know if that kind of confidence mattered as much or maybe more for your students in the prison, but. My, my students were older. Yeah. To begin with, uh, in general, the, the average age is around 20. So that really helped with those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah the question of whether this, this stuff that they're studying is actually applicable, um, that, that sparked a lot of conversations. I would like my students to be aware that the other positions they and others hold almost always have some assumption buried behind it. Yeah. And predisposed to looking for that and examining whether they agree with the assumptions of the positions that Yeah. Let me, let me go on because I we're unfortunately a little short on time. Um, well, often when, when we, Joseph has probably heard this many times, but when we uh, teach in prisons and we tell people, oh, you've got a captive audience. That's not exactly true. Really, you're the, you're the one who's the captive in there. Because you're going in, if you're going to teach in a prison, you're teaching a very different uh, environment. Uh, Joseph's already talked a little bit about that. And it's a very different moral environment. Um, there's, there's the challenges that are posed by the institution itself. Um, there's a lot of them that inhibit or interfere with education. And so what I've come to think of over time, and I didn't do this at first. Uh, I just sort of threw things together, is you really need to adopt a sort of dialectical approach where you do, you know, things are affecting things from 
both sides. I mean, there has to be a reflection on what it is you're actually trying to achieve in the classes. Um, and then course design. I've become a great believer in actually spending a lot of time on designing courses before you actually throw the students into them. And then some, some engaging practices within the courses themselves that can tie in with the communities that exist within any prison. Um, some of the conditions and challenges for teaching ethics. Uh, you have the, the correctional institution itself. Um, and structuring of time and the, the lack of very good educational resources and spaces is, is one of the things that comes out of that. Um, the lives of the prison students themselves, that they're living within the prison affects it. The educational preparation of the students. Most students in prison uh, that are going to college got their GED in prison in, in most states. Moral development of the students, I'm going to talk about that in uh, a moment. Um, on the Kohlberg scale, um, inmates, criminals in general, tend to be about level one or level two. And there are certain factors within the prison itself that tend to reinforce that. And then there's the instructors themselves. Uh, we can constitute impediments to, to education. So the setting itself, one thing that um, goes to the, the question about academic freedom, for example, as in, uh, being critical, the education that happens in a prison has to be compatible with the good order of the institution. That's just a, a given. Um, you can't be telling them, um, barricade yourself in and start burning things. Uh, that, that simply, you know, that, that's outside the realm of possibility. That would be to the harm of the prisoners anyway. Um, institutions can be more or less receptive to educators coming in from the outside. The prison staff have their own attitudes. Some of them are very resentful of the fact that the prisoners are getting what to them seems like a free education, and others um, are very supportive of it. So, time is a big problem. This is one that you have less control over. Scheduling tends to be seminar format because you have to fit within the, the, the very regimented uh, blocks of time within the prison. Um, there are unpredictable interruptions. You can have lockdowns where the entire prison is, is locked down and everybody's in their cells. You can't teach that. But you, you have to somehow get in the content that you need to. Um, sometimes you have to do emergency counts where they say, okay, everyone has to leave the classroom. We have to count all the prisoners within the institution. Most prisons uh, count at least two to three times a day. Every single prisoner to make sure that they, they know where they are. Educational spaces and, and resources. Um, at, at Indiana State Prison, they did have computer labs, a library, classrooms. Everything is very substandard. Uh, but you, you simply have to make do. The students themselves, a lot of them work. In maximum security prisons, most jobs within prisons are actually done by prisoners. Except for guarding them. Sometimes food service has been uh, privatized, but the uh, fire department tends to be prisoners, uh, all the sanitation is prisoners, all the maintenance tends to be prisoners. So in my classes, I would have some students who were actually working 40 hours a week, uh, as well as going to school. The cell blocks or dorms can be very noisy, which makes it difficult to study, uh, makes it difficult to read, sometimes makes it difficult to get assignments done. Educational preparation, like I, like I said, um, it, it tends to be, these are all underprepared students for the most part. There are exceptions, but um, when you structure classes, you should gear it towards, towards that level. Uh, moral development, which we're a bit more interested in here, um, there are correlations between lack of moral development and crime. There's no one-to-one -one correlation. It's not a thing about necessary and sufficient conditions because human beings are very complex, and there's also volitional factors involved. But um, the Kohlberg scale is actually fairly useful for this. Uh, I'm, I'm not you know, advocating that we have to shoehorn everything into that, um, but it's very useful for thinking about what we're going to do in prisons. The prison environment by itself um, does not tend to promote moral development. Um, it doesn't also necessarily disinhibit it. It's not you know, completely brutal. There, there, there are prisons like that. They tend to be in other countries. Uh, not so much in, the, in our system so much uh, these days. Many of the students entering are, are at a low level of, of development. So this is, this is what I myself ended up thinking about as I was teaching. Um, 
I found that I was actually interfering with my students' progress in some things. And um, these are things that you could ask yourself if you were thinking about teaching at prison. Um, what sort of obstacles would we bring? Um, what sort of pre preconceptions about prisoners, about prisons, about prison staff? Any of those sort of things can get in the way. Um, Give us an example. Well, if uh, one, one of the problems that we, we tended to have with first-year professors was um, they, they, they would be argumentative or have an attitude with, with prison staff. And if you're going into a prison, particular, particularly a maximum security prison, you're in their institution. And if you make trouble, you're going to have a very hard time getting any sort of cooperation. And you need cooperation from the staff. Um, one can also be sort of demeaning towards the, the prisoners or standoffish towards them. Um, and, you know, some of these things are, are unconscious. They're, they're, I'll, I'll give you a particularly egregious example. I always dress like this when I, when I teach. And I did that in my, my prison classes. And one of the prisoners told me about another professor who wasn't there anymore, who had usually taught in fairly, you know, fairly casual, you know, like a polo shirt or something like that. And then one day he showed up in a suit and tie, and the prisoners asked, um, why are you so dressed up? Are you going to you know, fancy dinner or something like that? And the guy said, um, no, I'm going to teach my real students on campus. Oh. And so that sort of thing, and, you know, very quickly, turns people off. <laughs> it makes, it makes a, a bad classroom environment. Wow. But what, you know, where did that come from? Preconceptions about the value of these people that he was teaching. I'm especially interested in the last one because I suspect a lot of people in this room might yes. be motivated to teach because of those kinds of aspects. Yeah, ironically. Yeah. And, and, and the way I'm getting at this is when I teach ethics, I, when I do feminist ethics, we do the Gilligan critique of Kohlberg. Yeah. And then I talk about the psychology faculty I know who say everyone thinks Kohlberg is, is bad, bad psychology. Yeah. But height and others that do more reasoning, they think they've got something there that you can test. Whereas the DI1 and 2, DIT1 and 2, the culprit, none of them think that's valid and reliable. Yeah. They, they just think it's awful. So, for example, yeah. if we were to do a unit on moral development in the prison, yeah. and I were to march out my liberal progressive critique of Goldberg, and you do Gilligan's critique. Goldberg is already liberal. Because, I mean, just traditionally speaking, in terms of moral theory, you know, yeah. conscience and, and very uh, generic principles at the, at the very top. Yeah, to but of course the Gilligan critique is That's McIntyre's critique. Girls never get, and women don't get to the top level on Colbert because they're deficient. And I think yeah. that's a pretty liberal view to say well, women aren't morally deficient. The top. Right, but especially the girls and women, right? They're doing yeah, yeah. group think and care and you know, we don't want well, to do that. Level, they're at level three. Yeah, right. So you know, unless we want to think they're morally backward, yeah. there's something wrong. But I mean, could you have this discussion oh, yeah. with the group of prisoners without them tagging you with this liberal progressive? Yeah, I don't, I don't mean that's, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's really I mean the sort of pervasive, I'm here to fix the world, oh, the sorry. administration okay. are all bad, bad. because you know, the, the prison system, there's no prison system in America. Mm -hmm. um, there are all sorts of DOCs, and some of them are very good, some of them are bad. The conditions vary from prison to prison to prison. And um, so, yeah, when it comes down to it, a lot of the things that, that instructors come into the classroom um, and push as sort of the majority view, the students are distrustful of it. Mm -hmm. um, the discipline, not, I only, not, not only talk philosophy, I talk religious studies. And religious studies are, has a real little tilt. Yeah. To it. Um, and so, you know, they, they, could, they could see them in the textbooks that we were using. I'm pretty middle of the road. I'm critical of everybody. So that they, they like that. Well, I have a colleague who teaches in prisons, and he says the nice thing about it is that they all see that there's a spin or a game with everything, right. which is like seeing the assumptions under the text. So he said he got that. But I'd be thinking, if I did a feminist unit in ethics, would they be thinking, man, you're way out there like those wacky academics. It, would be, want to fix it really would depend on how you pitched it. Okay. Um, this, this idea of learning other people's perspectives and being able to say what it is that you, you disagree with them. That's, that's part of moral development. That's part of what we try to teach them in the ethics classes. Mm -hmm. and, but if you're, if you're peddling something like feminism is good in and of itself, oh, okay. which is a dominant assumption. I mean, any, here's the thing, with moral theory, any moral theory, if we're really good philosophers, 
has to always be ready to provide a justification sure. for itself. Right. It can't just assume that oh, we're the good guys, we're going to come in and, and, and teach you. And that's, that's what happens on both ends of the ideological spectrum, mm -hmm. the right and the left sure. do that. Just so happens that most university professors tend to be on the left. So, yeah. Joseph made a point that I'd like to go back to. It has to do with self-preservation. Because um, when I teach, I go into the audience with a handheld mic. Yeah. Could I do that in prison? Because oh, yeah. We, we had a professor who um, had Parkinson's. And so he was having trouble on uh, his vocal cords. And he had to uh, he had to be given a microphone so he could project the speaker. Um, you're, you're, you're going to get searched. No, I mean, I go into the students with a handheld, and I ask them questions, and I'll pass the mic around. Sure. Remember, like, Phil Donahue used to do Yeah, that's not necessarily a problem. That would depend, again, on the DOC that you're in. Because some prisons like Attica don't take, they don't negotiate with hostages, right? I mean, I, I, it's a legitimate concern, I think. I, 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 I don't yeah, when I I want to walk out of there. When I talk for Ball yeah. State in Indiana, Ball State had been in the Indiana prisons Never an incident of an inmate ever physically threatening a professor. And Ball State, at the time that I left, still had 135 professors full time in, in the Indiana prison. Um, now, one reason why this took place, why the, you know nobody um, messed with the professors, was if if there was any incident, that would result in Ball State pulling out, and whoever did it would be immediately targeted by all the other prisoners. Oh. And a lot of the prisoners formed strong bonds with their professors as well. When the riots took place at Newcastle, um, there were Arizona prisoners who were being housed in the Indiana uh, prison units. They rioted. And we had Ball State professors behind the riot lines. The Indiana inmates escorted the professors who were caught behind the lines to the safe zone. So. At least in, in that state, like I wouldn't want to teach, for instance, in the California DOC. I consider that one to be just a, a complete hellhole. It's unmanageable. Nobody knows what's going on. There's no way I'd ever, I'd ever teach that because I couldn't teach that. Confidence in the security. Um, that's that's an extreme. Um, most DOCs seem to be pretty good about this sort of thing. W would you teach, like you're doing a utilitarian unit, would you teach Bentham's Panopticon where, you know, everyone gets... Well, I was remarked about it, yeah. Yeah, you know, they, okay. They get a kick out of that. Um, but no, when, when we teach utilitarianism, what I usually end up having them do, and they're, they're very good at this, is start carrying out utilitarian calculations and provide justifications for why precisely this should be weighted this way and this should be weighted this way. I, I do want to talk about the, the moral development theory stuff. And, and point out somebody else, another researcher who's done a lot of work on this. Um, you're all familiar with the Colbert's theory. I'm going to go ahead. There's this guy, Stephen DeGuy, and he has been uh, an administrator, a professor in, in the uh, Canadian prison system for a very long time. He's done a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of work on prison education and philosophy itself. And a lot of this ties in closely with the moral development. So you see him in the bibliography that I provide you. Um, there's also some other useful supplements for, for thinking of this in the Colbertian theory, the ethics of care. Actually, a lot of phenomenological approaches from the 20th century, like Gabriel Marcel, Dietrich von Hildebrand, and Mark Scheler um, do really the same thing that the Gilligan. You get the same mileage out of, out of them that you would with the ethics of care. Um, in a lot of ways, the, the Kohlberg uh, approach and the Weed's approach are actually neo Aristotelian without realizing that they, they are, because they presume that there's a, a human potential that has to be developed. It doesn't develop automatically on its own just by removing impediments that it actually has to be fostered and steered at certain points so that, that the will is part of that. This, this goes to some of the questions that were being asked. What actually works? What, what's needed? Um, where do you put yourself as a professor? Like I put here, education, if it's going to work, it has to be something additional. It recognizes that it's in an institution uh, but it supplies something that's, that's been lacking in that, that institution. So it's not oppositional to the prison system. That, that's just a recipe for, for failure. But it doesn't allow itself to be simply co-opted. And the prison, sometimes, 
uh, DOCs will try to use the educational plan that they have to get you to monitor the prisoners or be a disciplinarian. Uh, and that's just this sort of part of the course, and you usually just resist them. Um, another thing that it allows is in incorporating and reflecting on students' experience and, and, and the environment. You, you bring that, um, uh, somebody brought up the, um, the need to actually reflect on one's decision making, the, the, the assumptions that one's doing, bringing these things into the light. A lot of times, we've well, all experienced this in ethics classes. What happens is students have ideas and they throw them out on the table. And they, they want to stay at that level. They don't want to provide justifications uh, for why they say this is the right thing to do. They just want to argue with each other, in the bad sense of shouting at each other. Um, that, that happens in prisons a lot as well. And we want to help prisoners learn how to step back and start providing justifications for what it is that they think. And, and doing that with their experiences as well. Um, Another thing that's very important is offering students involvement and identifications, not only with the community outside the prison, uh, there's a lot of ways to do this, but also with this, this broad cultural heritage that we call humanities, which I think is very liberating. That's sort of what Joseph was talking about. Um, the Gweed makes a good argument that what's really needed for moral transformation are broad-based humanities disciplines. Buster, he, he, particular, he doesn't actually like philosophy so much, which is interesting. He says that the most moral transformation probably takes place in English and history classes. And I think that really has to do with the way philosophy is taught. Uh, one, one thing that I, myself, in reflecting on this, have decided is the typical analytic approach is not going to be helpful for moral transformation. Um, what, what Joseph was calling um, uh, speculative philosophy, or I would call hermeneutical philosophy, or just sort of the broad current of the way we did philosophy before the, the analytic movement, um, that's what's needed. Something that's fairly systematic, that allows them to have something to sink their teeth into, uh, and, and relax against. I'll just talk about this last thing. Uh, I'm, if, if you go to the, uh, the website that I have listed on, on the top, I'm going to be uploading a lot of these materials there, so, as well as some other things I'm so you can, you can get the full benefit of the workshop then. Here's one fundamental problem that we always have to work around. And this, this ties into course design. Um, a lot of the learning has to take place outside of the classroom. So the question is, how do we structure our classes? This is probably something you've all thought quite a bit about already. How do we structure our classes so that our students are engaged with the material and coming to class here, um, having actually digested the material, having thought quite a bit about um, how do we do that in the prison environment? Learning has to be cumulative and, and structured. It has to build off of itself. It has to integrate things from their environment as well. Um, this is what I've done. I, I, um, I've been putting a lot of effort into course design. I also think that part of that is planning ahead for the recurring teachable moments that come up. Classes. I mean, you're all, all of you have taught ethics classes, I think. You've all had those early on moments, as well as moments later on where some student just lapses completely into relativism and takes up 20 minutes of class time and you have to go over that, that material again. Well, that can be a great teachable moment, and it can be a great teachable moment with talking about stages of moral development. You can say, well, you know, what would, you can do this with Holder, you can do this with whoever you want. Why is, why is this stance being the put out here as where we should be, where the classroom, all of us as a whole should be. When we know there's something better, what is that something better? And then you let the students start to do that. And they will actually come in and start criticizing each other and saying, yeah, we, we covered that uh, back in the first week. Don't be a relativist. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do that with uh, sort of tropes about egoism. Everybody's out for themselves. Yeah. Have you even thought about filming your work and turning it into a documentary? Um, there's, I mean, there's obstacles to that in prison systems. Uh, it could be done. The Indiana DOC actually allowed something which is really remarkable. They allowed some, some massive, really high quality cameras in, in, to be brought in by this um, evangelical music group in the Indiana State. I, I haven't thought much about, about doing, uh, doing that with 
prison education. Um, oh, one other thing too. Flexibility is required. Getting ready to, to change course. Um, I'll give you a very quick example and I'll close. I taught a contemporary philosophy class and we focused on phenomenology for the most part. And this doesn't tie in with, with, with um, moral reasoning or anything like that for sale. Some students did do some writing uh, using, using Shaler um, and Marcel. I decided about halfway through the, the course that instead of just doing sort of doctrinaire, okay, this is how phenomenological analysis is carried out, um, you know, we're going to read some quotes from them, we're going to read some and all that, to have them actually do phenomenological analyses of prison life and try to get, gain experience in, in uh, uh, that as a, as a practice. And I, I came up with some really interesting material through it. Some, some of the material wasn't very good because they, they didn't really know what they were doing and some of the students were not that interested in the class, but the, the material that was good was very good and very interesting to do. And if I didn't, if I wasn't ready to um, change the syllabus halfway through the semester, if I didn't have that sort of flexibility, I couldn't have done that. Um, I think actually teaching in the prison system, since there's usually less oversight by your on-campus administrators, uh, lets you do that more easily. Ironically. You know, in some ways, you have more freedom in the prison than you do. Um, there, there are more materials in here, but we're over time, actually, so... Has this significantly improved your teaching in the traditional classroom? Yes. I would imagine that it has. Yeah. Um, precisely how I can trust to, to say right now, but yes. Yeah. Um, I've actually used examples from the prison in the classroom, and that tends, for some reason, it tends to get the students to not only pay attention, but to be less worried. Probably take No, all of I enjoyed teaching in prison more than I Yes, I'm in general. And, and you know, if you have a if you have a good prison system where there has been education in one for one time, the stuff that you teach about is going to get debated in the um, the um, so. uh, I'll be here for the rest.